Welcome to our webinar today on what's on your plate. It's April 27th. It's springtime here in Alberta, and we're all feeling warm for the day. Uh, this is a session where we'll be, we'll be exploring consumer for food choices and impacts, including the French fries market. Uh, and why this topic, given the, 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 the technologies we've been covered and the forces and source of change, why this topic? Well, it, it seems that food's in the news, not just because of pricing, but because of all the controversy around, are we really making the right choices? And, and as we noted in our headlines, that the impacts of our food choices are not just on health. Uh, our lifestyle appears to be all about convenience, but it has a, a bearing on our budget. It's one of the top items in, uh, in what we spend each month. It also has a bearing on others' jobs and the economy. It certainly has a bearing on health, your health, and also healthcare costs in a country where we hear in some countries bur burgeoning numbers of people dying from diabetes, from health issues, uh, and even the environment. Uh, what, you, what you consume and what you don't consume and ending up in the garbage has a bearing on our environment. So these are reasons to have a, a topic of this nature. And I welcome you. I, I ask you if you're a, a viewer to mute uh, so that we don't pick up on coughing and sneezing and other things that go on thanks to our bodily functions. Uh, regardless, we have with us a, an esteemed a number of, 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 of presenters or, or commentaries, if you will. Greg Conley, with his background as an international chef uh, and also working at, at the food truck business. So he's got a, a wide array of experience with consumers in a wide variety of settings. Uh, Trevor, economic development officer in, in Lethbridge, but he's here primarily because he has executive experience in food processing. And Brianna, who I've known for many years when she was with the uh, Food Council, uh, now with Economic Development in Leduc, uh, has a, a wide array of experiences. I, I won't say in the regulatory sector, but in the sector looking at, at food and agriculture as a whole. So I'll leave it at that. And I'm, I'm going to start out with, uh, with you, Greg, in that you've had such e exposure internationally and and in the streets with food trucks, why is it people buy what they do buy or consume what they do buy? What What is your sense as a chef and how did, how did it uh, affect you as a chef? How did you uh, know what the market wanted? Yeah, let's get right into it. Um, you know, people and their food choices, it's very interesting because people are very educated on world food. So the options, are broader than they've ever been. The ingredients available are, you know, broader than they've ever been. Um, we have more information, you know, in a click of a button, you can get five healthy recipes. You can get, you know, whatever you really need for information. So I think people are making decisions based on all kinds of factors uh, within the same week. They prioritize maybe the ingredients or the service for the situation. Um, I feel like people tend to choose tastier options or more refined options, maybe for dinner preparations. Um, and then maybe they choose slightly easier options if they're dining in and they're on a tight time schedule. So honestly, like timing is huge, convenience is huge. Pricing is huge, um, but we're also, you know, our palates are getting, I think, more refined as a as a society as well. We're not just um, willing to accept, you know, simple foods anymore. We're going for more interesting combinations. Um, your question about how, you know, how would we choose it in the in a hotel and a restaurant? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, same kind of idea. We are trying to provide options at various price points for various scenarios because people are so specialized, I would say, these days. We certainly see that in a supermarket. I mean, I, I commented earlier when we were chatting before the, the webinar began about walking down an aisle, whether it be in a superstore or, or even in a smaller grocery store, the number of choices and the number of places in the world that food is coming from. You go to an <clears throat> Italian center here in Edmonton and, and you're, you're visiting the globe. You're seeing things from Poland, from Hungary, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from China. These are choices of foods that people have almost no experience other than what's yeah. on the label. And sometimes the label isn't even in their language. Bri Brianna, 
Uh, your experience, is there anything you want to add that maybe Greg hasn't touched on or elaborate as it relates to food choices? I would say one piece I think that's important is culture. So depending on which culture you come from or culture you marry into um, really impacts the foods that you eat and the foods that you become comfortable with cooking and use on an ongoing basis. So, and we are in a multicultural society now. I mean, that's been a policy at the federal level and with the number of people immigrating, whether it be into to Calgary, Edmonton, Montreal, Vancouver, the, the population's changing and the what's available in this uh, on, on menus and what's available in the stores is reflecting that. Very good point. Uh, Trevor, um, your experience in food processing is probably very relevant to understanding consumer choice. Anything you want to add? Consumers are diverse, right? I mean, food processing, large, multi, you know, large companies are always collecting inordinate amounts of data. So everything from the flavor profile, but even the visual look of the product. So for example, we were talking about potatoes earlier. Potatoes, potato chips in North America tend to have a white flesh color, whereas mm -hmm. in Europe, yellow is preferred by the consumer. Hmm. So no substantial difference in nutritional profile. In my opinion, no substantial difference in flavor profile, but just the visual presentation of the product, there's a cultural norm around what a potato should look like, for example. But it's it's everything from the packaging, the color of the packaging, where on the shelf the packaging goes, and then appealing to the various different segments of society. I mean, what appeals to my, um, you know, twenty-something son is not quite the same as what appeals to my mother-in-law. And so, it's you know, consumer packaged goods companies are having to appeal to those broad sets of palettes, which are becoming more and more complex, as Brianna noted, based on cultural influences. I do think, as Greg noted, that price has certainly become a factor, particularly in the current inflationary environment. So now you've got segmentation by various price points, right? We see that with private label versus branded, but even within a brand, you'll sometimes have a premium version of the same product trying to appeal to a smaller segment yet, even with the same, essentially the same basic product. So it's interesting how there are many individual preferences which inform our own decisions, but as a result, all of these consumer packaged goods companies respond in kind by adjusting their portfolio and perpetually making changes to, to what they offer consumers. So what a menu looks like, what the package looks like, in other words, what our eyes absorb is a pre precursor to taste. Uh, that's what marketing is all about. I, there are colors which are preferred with foods and colors that aren't. Uh, that have a bearing on, I guess what how how you put a dessert together, Greg. What colors you may have on a uh, on a cupcake uh, may have a bearing on on sales on on uh, on preferences. Yeah, I noted uh, when you were making that comment on about marketing and and how how we are visual people when it comes to food before because that comes before the taste. Um, I think of the, the fact that in a uh, supermarket, there are carrots that don't look particularly good that are sold off sale. Uh, so how a carrot looks, how a bean looks, how a corn or cob looks has a bearing on whether people will consume it because what it looks like, regardless of what it tastes like, comes first. And I think about strawberries. Anybody want to com comment on the, on the market of strawberries? Anybody have any experience with that? I got a little bit. I, we, we were in, uh, I, I think it was uh, Cabo St. Lucas, and I'm in the ocean, and there's a guy sitting next to me. We got chat, standing next to me. We got chatting. Turns out he grows strawberries in California. And I said to him, strawberries don't taste very good anymore. He said, no, but they sure do look good. What was he telling us, Brianna? That you'll buy it in the hopes that it might be tasty because you've had a tasty one at some point in time. <laughs> And you and you keep on buying the same ones. So the supermarket supplies different brands of strawberries. And that's what he said. I can I can make a strawberry taste really good, but it may not look as good. So, but the ones that sell are the ones that look good. So yeah, yeah, further further to your point there, Perry, not just looking good, but looking good for a length of time as well mm -hmm. is you know strongly developing or strongly influencing um, the products that are sold. Um, you know, an interesting uh, development I heard about was the type of packaging that prepackaged salads come in allowed an entire, 
like billion dollar industry to th thrive. Because salads used to be, used to have romaine and you had green leaf, red leaf, and that purple kale, right? And now you have all these different kinds of mixes. And a lot of that is because the type of breathable plastic that they're packaged in allows for up to three weeks, three weeks of lifetime, right? Or set, you know, sellable time, uh, as opposed to maybe a week before. So mm -hmm. we're getting, I don't know, it's providing some better options, but some packages are using it to extend life of, you know, average products as well. You know, right. kind of goes both ways. Well, another aspect of this is the avocado, which was not a saleable product until they renamed it. And it used to be a California alligator. So it had something to do with the skin, that look, that alligator-like surface until they changed it. Once it became an avocado, the taste didn't change, the, the look didn't change, but the naming changed. And that was enough to create what's today a multi-billion dollar market. Culture and taste. Uh, I'm aware that uh, some people like, like sours, others like sweets. In North America, we serve ham with pineapple. Uh, we serve pork with apples. But in other parts of the world, it's sours. So you talk about taste and culture has a bearing. Brianna, you were making that point earlier. Um, you must you must have had some of that experience when you were moving around internationally, Greg, of different tastes and cultures. Oh, absolutely. Um, and honestly, everywhere I've worked, one of my favorite things about meeting new people is discovering where they're from and what's the food like. It's an instant connection you can make with new people. And uh, in my new, where I work now, I transferred buildings and there are three Nigerian guys on my floor. And so we've had a great time learning about some Nigerian food. Um, we make, we've been making jollof rice, which is like a spicy tomato based rice. It's just absolutely delicious. Um, and so I think it's interesting to find out how these base ingredients that everyone uses can be, you know, transformed with subtle variation. Well, now I know how to spot a chef. Instead of saying, how are you? He'll say, what do you eat? Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, Trevor, anything further you want to add to the discussion on, on customer choice? Uh, one thing we have avoided so far, and I'll get, I'll get to that in a minute, but um, is nutrition, nutritional value, health implications, uh, and the extent to which that has a bearing on, on market. It doesn't sound like it's top, top of the mind, but Trevor, anything you want to add uh, about consumer choice here yet? I'll come back to your example of strawberries. So as many people will probably know, just outside of Acme, Alberta, Sunterra has a very large greenhouse operation and you actually can produce strawberries in Alberta and they don't have to travel that far. So the packaging is different. The sustainability impacts are quite different. And I think that's really the future of food around, you know, coming back to consumer choice, mm -hmm. sustainability, carbon footprints have not really been a focal point in North America. I mean, travel through Europe and other parts of the world, you can actually see the carbon footprint of the product is required on the packaging itself, right? How much carbon is this particular chocolate bar worth is pasted right on the front of the chocolate bar. That may drive some different behaviors from food manufacturers to, it's almost following the same trend of friend shoring and near shoring because of the fun we've had with supply chains uh, as a result of COVID. But I think consumer choice is going to drive some of those discussions around, well, maybe I don't want my salad to be shipped from the Imperial Valley in California. Maybe I don't want it to be, you know, a week old by the time it's in my basket. Maybe I want something that's closer to home. And even by closer, I mean somewhere within Alberta, perhaps that's that's easier to grasp for the for the average consumer. So I think consumer choice is, is becoming more and more complex and it just creates even more sort of opportunities for companies to figure out how to meet those needs and demands from consumers. Brianna, I think some of the work that you're doing has a bearing on the, the 100 mile or 100 kilometer decision of how where does my food come from? Uh, I'd like it not to have to travel so long, but I also like to have and buy local. Uh, you, you see the popularity of, of farmers markets. It's, it's astounding, the popularity of, of farmers markets today. But Brianna, do you want anything there? Sure. I think another piece that adds into that is we keep seeing all these various different scares with regard to um, animal diseases, with regard to um, contamination and foodborne pathogens. And that's another piece that's prompting people to try and support local, know where your farmer is, know what the product is, what it's been, how it's been treated, what it's been tested with, like all of those pieces 
um, consumers now are aware and want to know that. Whether they know what to do with that or not is a whole nother question, but they're asking for and wanting that if they have the means to do so. Well, it's very interesting. The information that is available on a, uh, on a label um, about carbohydrates and sodium and sugar, et cetera, et cetera. There's more information being provided from a public regulator that I guess imposes upon these suppliers. You've got to provide some basic information uh, to the consumer who theoretically or presumably, at least from a public perspective, ought to be interested in these things, whether they are reading those labels or not, maybe another matter. Uh, Trevor, uh, with your background, is there anything going on in the regulatory world that is having a bearing on what we should be consuming as opposed to what we are? Yeah, I mean, I think governments over time are always looking for ways to improve food quality. So, for example, trans fats was a big deal uh, about 20 years ago, and many food companies shifted away from uh, different oils and shortenings to, to move to more sort of healthier heart oils, as they were called. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sodium content is something that's that's always sent, tends to cycle through and raise its ugly head. I mean, I, I do think the regulatory environment, to Brianna's point, has been prompted a lot by those disasters that we've seen in the U.S. with contagion and contaminants. But it's also about traceability. People are more interested in those kinds of things these days. But it's it's broader than that, right? I mean, I, there's more and more demand for information, and I, I I'll use myself as an example. When I'm training for something and I've been known to do endurance races and a few other crazy things because I'm clearly not that bright, uh, I'm very focused on the nutritional label. Like every calorie counts. Mm -hmm. I'm very, very focused on what's going in my body and I'm mm -hmm. tracking it in a computer application. But then there are times when I'm not doing that where I really don't care. I'll shove pretty much whatever I can grab in my face. So, you know, again, we've seen these things where consumers are saying, oh, I want low sodium products. So marketers, you know, they, they produce these products that are low sodium, they advertise them as low sodium and they don't sell because consumers are like, well, wait a second, I wanted my satisfying snack. So mm -hmm. what you often find is that food companies will make changes to the formulation to meet the regulatory requirements. They'll actually make the product healthier, but they won't mm -hmm. tell anyone that mm -hmm. right? unless it's, unless there's a way to, to market that they'll mm -hmm. keep that very silent. Cause it's also usually reduces your cost at the same time to find a better formulation. Right? So it's, it's interesting how as consumers, we often say we want a certain attribute or a certain health aspect, but then our purchasing behaviors don't really align to that demand. And we see that all the time. Some people have expressed concerns with things like the Canada Food Guide and the, the way the public regu the, the, the regulator makes information available that they may in fact be biased, that their bias may be influenced in a capitalistic society that uh, they're getting somebody's getting votes because they're allowing some food processor to cut corners, uh, go over the line. Uh, do, you, do you have any sense of why we should or shouldn't have confidence in the regulator as it relates to our foods today? Anyone want to comment there? It's a toughie, I know, and I won't, uh, uh, I can always delete this if you're worried about an election coming and who's going to win or lose, but uh, it, 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 there is a sensitivity out there whether regulators in the food industry are in fact biased as a byproduct of uh, of donations of capital or of research coming from uh, uh, sources that have in fact received grants from industry. I can't comment on the, uh, you know, the regulatory side of it, but I'd love to comment on the Canada Food Guide. Um, honestly, I think there are a hundred sources that people check before that. You know, because there's so much more information out there these days, people are so specific compared to, I think, you know, I learned about the Canada Food Guide in, let's say, the early 90s. Well, since then, people aren't just looking up how to run a marathon. Like Trevor said, like, there's training for specific events and the information you can get, you know, to train or to, you know, plan your meals around for certain um, what do you call it? Efforts or certain trials or certain event, uh, sporting events. It's way more specific than the Canada Food Guide. So I don't, I don't know if if it's that popular. What do you guys think? Well, uh, I mean, the Canada Food Guide, I, I don't think is for your high end competitive professional. It's probably more for your general consumer with an IQ averaging in a country a hundred. You've got to be very careful of recognizing that. 
the average IQ of a citizen is 100. Uh, how, how much can you expect them to be researching the specifics? Vicki, it's a little early, but go ahead. Tell us what you'd like to share with us. Well, I'm thinking back to the you know earlier iterations of the Canada Food Guide and you know, probably 50 or 60 years ago when fat was the big evil. It got bred out of beef, so now it's tougher and less tasty. And, you know, without fat, you don't get a lot of flavor. So it was replaced by sugar, which in the long run has turned out to be worse. And right. <clears throat> so it seems to me that often the experts are doing their best with what they happen to know at the time, but they don't foresee all the unintended consequences of the decisions they make. So, you know, when you see a visual image of a plate that is, you know, this much devoted to fruits and vegetables and a small slice to meats and a, you know, medium size pie slice for carbohydrates, the specifics, um, you know, keep changing, but they are trying to point people towards a healthier diet. It's just when you get down to the details, it, it doesn't always work out as planned. Well, this, this really is what undermines trust, uh, is when you are consistently changing from whether peanut butter is good for you or cigarettes should or shouldn't be smoked. You know, today we're all pretty confident about the relevance of cigarettes and health, but when it comes to fats, uh, sugars, carbohydrates, french fries, one year you're hearing one thing from one research source and the next year you're hearing almost the opposite. And people, when I talk to them, say, who do I trust? Because one year it's good for you and the next year it's not so good for you. Eggs and yolks and whites. I'm, I'm waiting for them to tell us the good part about nicotine. And it does apparently work well as some kind of test plant for various things, not so much for consumption, but there are uh, experimental uses when developing pharmaceuticals. They well, think use um, nicotine plants apparently so there is a, there is a chemical and I'm, i want to get the pronouncer pronunciation right called acrylamide and acrylamide apparently as a chemical uh forms in high temperature processing particularly of potatoes uh toast uh french fries um there since 2017 from the research that i did in preparing for today uh came out claiming uh, toxic implications of this and research comes and goes. Let's look at the French fry just by way of example, simply it was in the news today. I don't know whether how many of you saw whether it is in your local newspaper to quote, no French fries won't make you depressed, experts say. But as I put in the, the note this afternoon that I sent to you, French fries are in the news a lot. The controversy is over whether high temperature cooking of potatoes such as French fries and roasted coffee, et cetera, and exposure to the resulting chemical uh, acrylamide uh, poses a health risk. Quote, no French fries won't make you depressed, experts say, because the zebra fish that apparently was hanging around the bottom of the fish tank may not have had been anxious or depressed, as the Chinese researcher was claiming. Uh, and also not to worry, the facts are, are acry acry acrylamide is uh, not going to cause cancer, and that's from a, a cancer research institute. Uh, and another saying, uh, moderation is recommended. A Harvard professor gave a very thorough analysis of French fries because it was he wanted to get the facts out. And yet we see this controversy continuing. Greg, when you were a, a chef, uh, whether it was a food truck or in Swiss in Switzerland, was there any anxiety around using French fries and putting it on your plate? No, nobody hesitates for French fries. No, I've never, I've never seen it. You've never seen the controversy? Or I've never seen anyone hesitate. <laughs> hesitate, good for you. I, honestly, I yeah. think it's a similar approach to, I mean, I don't want to link the two, but to smoking. Like people are aware that there are risks associated with cigarettes. People are aware that there's risks associated with deep fried foods. Mm -hmm. But there are some overwhelmingly compelling reasons to consume potato chips and, and French fries. You know, mm -hmm. they there are very few foods that have that same kind of satisfying effect mm -hmm. for that price point that can be cooked in a medium you can train a 13 year old to make. You know, it's it's so hard to get away from them, I would say. Mm -hmm. Trevor, you want to add anything there? 
about the relevance of French fries. You know, we didn't we didn't raise much about nutrition and health. The, those words didn't really come up in our initial discussions on consumer choice. But now now we're in the middle of it. So you're up, up to you, Trevor. Yeah, I want to come back to your comment about acrylamide. Like, uh, you know, it was well publicized over the last decade or so. Acrylamide forms anytime you heat a carbohydrate. So right. if you've ever had toast, if you've ever cooked pasta, if you've ever cooked potatoes, you have ingested acrylamide, right? That's that's fact. In large, large quantities, yes, there's a, some risks to acrylamide, but large food processors have spent the better part of the last decade also trying to mitigate that. There are things you can do by reducing uh, spike temperatures at certain parts of the cooking process, for example. There are certain things you can do with enzymes and other additives that actually mitigates the formation of acrylamide. So a lot of money has been spent on that. But in my mind, you know, I come back to that moderation idea. I think we would all agree that water generally is good for you. Is that a fair statement that we would all agree that drinking lots of water is healthy, generally speaking? But if in the next 24 hours you ingest 12 liters of water, you are going to be in the ER and spending some quality time on dialysis. Your kidneys will shut down, right? So even water, which is pretty ubiquitous and barring contamination from other sources, healthy, even in vast quantities, water itself can be quite deadly and toxic to humans. So I think it comes back to that idea of know the risks, understand what you're eating, but make sure you're balancing the right amounts with the right, you know, again, whatever that portfolio looks like for you. I think that point was well made in the end of the article about the zebra fish that were showing can cancers after uh, being exposed to large amounts of this acrylamide. And the concluding note in the article is that as far as the Chinese depression study goes, because it was this Chinese study that indicated zebra fish get depressed when exposed to acrylamide, is that if you raise zebra fish, don't let them swim in acrylamide laced water. That was their conclusion from the research. <laughs> and and okay, Brianna, anything you want to you add here regarding nutrition and uh, consumer choice? Sure. Um, one of the things as we're all talking about this that I was thinking about is uh, the human is a complex system and everyone is different. And as a species, we're really terrible at solving and dealing with big complex systems. We want a simple answer. Eat potatoes, don't eat potatoes. Eat french fries, don't eat french fries. And our system just, that isn't the answer that works for these complex systems, but it's really hard to get to a solution um, on what you should eat when say Canada Food Guide is based on averages, right? So it's for the average human being. Well, who actually is average, right? And so it, the complexity is challenging um, from a consumer perspective. I think that's that's almost underscores why this session I thought was so interesting is because what we're seeing here, whether it be at an international level or the, the, what's coming out of research is the number of choices that human beings have regarding food is becoming so complex. And yet we, we have something called the Canada Food Guide, which you know, isn't going to be ad addressing the extremes of obese people or terribly skinny. It's going to try and meet what the public, the, the public being some average, which as you say, probably hardly exists. Uh, we do the best we can at a public level, but is it good enough? Uh, with all of the data that is now available on people, you would think that we should be able as an individual to set up, what is my profile? And therefore, chat GPT, what should I be eating that is, quote, healthy, well-priced, accessible, convenient, blah, blah, blah. It's complex. There's no question. And it isn't just food. We're facing this in so many different issues. I've got a grandson who's trying to figure out what's the best car for me. It's taking a fifth grade education to figure this out. I can't do it. I see you're all smiling. You've got grandchildren as well. Uh, what about uh, trends? Are we seeing anything in trends? Uh, China is now suffering through a huge rise of diabetic, uh, diabetes. It's becoming what they say epidemic. They're saying obesity in the United States is epidemic. This has something to do not just with the fact that manual labor isn't uh, in, in vogue anymore. It has something they believe to do with diet. Diet and health seem to be closely correlated. And yet diet, unless you're obese and wish you weren't, seems to be irrelevant. Uh, we just eat what we want to eat. Uh, what about the, these epidemics? Is there anything behind uh, the rise in heart disease, the rise in obesity and food choices? 
Brianna? Um, I would say I think a bit of this also comes down to the the population and like the different um, ages or groups that people are. The older you get, the more you might care about. I am going to have eat my way out of illness or eat my way out of death almost. And so there's a desire potentially for some people and depending on how many of that type of person is in the population. Um, there's like that desire to try and change it. So I can see like even at our farm on a farm level, um, a particular type of person that wants healthy food and is willing to pay for it and has the income to do so. But the vast majority of people don't, they just purchase whatever the, con the, the companies are creating and the companies are creating what people will buy. And so again, it comes back to your income and your preferences and convenience. Um, and I don't, I don't know if there's strong links yet um, to, to definitively show one is better than the other um, with regard to the endemics and the health concerns. So we, 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 we need to differentiate between volume, the amount that people eat, and what specifically is in that diet. And I, I think of visits to Costco and the obesity that is apparent when these huge carts and you look at the size of carts and you wonder if family size today is under two kids per house. Where is all this food going that's being consumed? So we, we seem to have both the volume issue that relates to obesity and we also have some specific issues like heart disease and, um, uh, uh, and cancers that seem to be food related. Uh, people need to become more aware of what they're eating, not just the nutritional value, but the health relevance. Uh, anybody want to add anything, uh, maybe of a more articulate matter? Uh, Tom, maybe you could talk about consuming wine, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the thing that worries me about is cereals. You walk <laughs> into these big stores, you know, and like, so especially the superstore, and it's just a wall of, Post or Kellogg's or one of these other cereal makers, and they produce these very high sugar, high high gluten, high everything cereals. And I certainly don't eat them, but I see they're uh, probably a cartel situation that closes in on uh, other companies that try to get on those shelves. Um, and you know, we really need that diversity. And it's not there. Uh, uh, Trevor, you want to add anything there? I mean, you're, you're probably closer to the be, being on the supply side. Uh, we've certainly seen, I can, I can recall, I mean, I'm, I'm 80, when sugar showed up, for, sugar frosted flakes. I think that was the first one with that <laughs> tiger advertising. Uh, right. And it's still advertising. But sugar on cereals became very popular. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, food is an incredibly powerful tool, right? So eating the right things, treating the right nutritional profile can be amazing, can make an amazing difference on a person's health. Mm -hmm. And it's knowing what those levers are for you individually. And there, I think there's clear links between certain diseases and certain profiles and certain dietary patterns. Um, and I've, and I've, you know, I've seen that, that make big difference in people's lives when they make an adjustment. And sometimes it's simple things. So you know, I live in a jurisdiction like most of you where printing calorie counts on menus is not a typical thing found in Alberta. Yeah. But if you go to that same restaurant in another jurisdiction, that lovely meal that you thought you were enjoying turns out being uh, at least a thousand calories more than you anticipated, right? And so even that sometimes from an awareness perspective can prompt a change in behavior if you're willing to do the math and know what the right number is. You know, it, Again, I think it comes down to if, if you're someone who's seeking treatment for cancer, they'll tell you flat out, don't eat a lot of sugar. You should remove sugar from your diet. Well, that that is a choice, but there is a known link between formation of cancer cells and high levels of sugar in the bloodstream. And so, again, I think it's up to us as individuals to make those informed choices, do the research, have an understanding of what you're putting into your body, but then understand the impacts for your situation. And everybody's situation is different. So what's your view on French fries? I'm a firm believer in anything in moderation is is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, I, I you know I'll be candid. I I don't eat dairy, 
And that's not a that's not a lactose intolerance thing. It's a preference. I have never liked cheese. I'm a big disappointment to most of my friends and family. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just never been something that I've I've liked from a texture flavor. So as a consequence, that sort of bled into I don't drink milk. I don't really eat ice cream. I don't really eat yogurt. And that's that's not even a health thing. It's just a preference thing. But I sure notice when I eat that stuff now, right? So for me, adjusting and finding other sources of nutrition that I would otherwise find in dairy works for me. And as long as I'm conscious of the risks and benefits that come with that, you know, it doesn't really impact anybody else, right? So I couldn't get an answer to, to French fries. How about potato chips? <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. I'm just pulling your crank. Uh, Greg, you want to add anything regarding, you know, I think you said earlier, you and I had had lots of conversations when you were younger about uh, A&W and French fries and onion rings. But uh, do you drink, do you eat French fries? Do you ha have a problem with French fries? Uh, I do eat French fries, yeah. um, probably more frequently than I care to admit. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't eat a lot of them. So I... I'm kind of a believer in, I, I, like I second what Trevor said, you know, anything in reasonable moderation. Sure. Um, but I, I don't eat a lot of consumer packaged goods intentionally from the store. Mm -hmm. um, but I will have a fully buttered, sweet yeast <sighs> bread, you know, studded with raisins and it could be caramel on there. I'd rather have a high calorie homemade food than a consumer packaged good, I guess. So when you when you produced French fries, right? it was in the uh, the uh, uh, truck or or a restaurant, whatever. Did you? How did you prepare it? Uh, what were the oils that you used? Uh, canola canola is pretty mm -hmm. much the standard uh, mm -hmm. everywhere I've worked um, from an availability and price standpoint. Um, those are the main drivers. But I definitely saw French fries fried in duck fat mm -hmm. in Montreal and in a couple of restaurants in Austria. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, yeah. most potatoes I've seen prepared, you know, fried in canola oil. And I would say 70% of those were what you would call potato products, i.e. they did not come in as a potato. They came in as a, you know, partially or almost ready to go uh, product. And then they were just finished in oil. Um, I think that's, that's pretty standard unless you're at a, let's call it reasonable mid range and up restaurant. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The audience may be wondering why are we focused on French fries? And it isn't just because of the controversy that has been raging from time to time about whether or not they're healthy or not seems a gen general uh, assessment is that uh, anything in moderation and how they're prepared is relevant and even different types of potatoes. But wh why this is important to us here in Alberta is whether you're aware of it or not, we have 40% of the world's supply of manufactured French fries, 40%. This is a big world and this is a big number. Uh, Brianna, any, any idea why Alberta would be a hotspot for the production of, of French fries? I don't know. I think that's a better question for Trevor since it's- I'm going to get to Trevor next. So I'm going to give you a shout out here sure not up here in the north so much. Um, I, I think it's an alignment of a number, number of things. The conditions in which the potatoes grow, the disease pressure that we don't necessarily have that other places have. Like there's a number of factors um, that make us the ideal environment to be able to do that uh -huh. um, would be my- well, apparently Alberta produces more potatoes now than Prince Edward Island. Now, uh, that's because Prince Edward Island's fallen off the wagon, maybe sea, sea rise or something. Trevor, you want to add any color here? We only have 15 more minutes, but I'll give you a full bore on why Alberta has become such a center point for the production of French fries. Yeah, I mean, it's it's potato products in general. So as you noted, Alberta is now Canada's largest producer of potatoes. So that's both table, that's French fries, that's potato chips, that's all of those things combined. And the single biggest thing is that the, the soil and the disease pressures that Brianna mentioned mean we get much better yields here in Alberta. So not only do you get more acres, more, more spuds per acre, but you get more solids out of the potatoes. So that's that's a technical term for the density or the product, the finished product that a producer can, can get off of that potato. So for example, 
in the Maritimes, you'll get potatoes with, you know, 18 or 19% solids, which is finished goods they can get out. Here in Alberta, you're seeing north of 20 or 21%. Two or 3% doesn't sound like a big difference until you're producing millions and millions of pounds of potatoes. That's a big margin difference. And, you know, we've got, we've got all the right weather ingredients. We've got the available water. PEI's big limitation, most of their irrigation comes from ground wells and many of them are running dry. So they're, they're facing limitations and having to put limits uh, and Alberta has not broached that situation yet. So I think, you know, the future is pretty bright for uh, potatoes and other crops in Alberta. Speaking of, speaking of bright, do we have a lot of sunshine? Uh, the most in Canada, 320 days in this particular corner of the province. So yeah, it's uh, it's pretty significant. And Vicky asked a comment in the, made a comment in the in the box there. Most of that is actually exported, Vicky. It's not for consumption in Alberta. Of course, Albertans eat lots of potato products. But a lot of the plants in my corner of the province are shipping both into the US, but also the Asian markets. So Japan uh, features quite prominently in exports right now as well. I raise the sun because some years ago I was consulting in the Northwest Territories and the Mackenzie River, one of the longest rivers in the world that very few people realize that in Canada, uh, has at a turning point what's called the garden. And that garden is in Fort Simpson. They grow potatoes up there because the sun shines 23, 24 hours a day in the summer. Their potatoes are five pound potatoes. I've never seen corn as high or potatoes as big as you can get in the Northwest Territories. What about the Yukon? Does Yukon produce, is Yukon gold really grown in the Yukon? I don't know. It's a question for another webinar, I'm sure. We could probably spend two hours on that one. Okay, I'm gonna open it up. We've got a few more minutes to a general discussion. Does anyone wanna, make a point regarding the economy of French fries, the toxicity, the production, the preparation, uh, the fact that consumers tend to lean more toward convenience than they are toward nutrition. Haley, anything you wanna to bring to the surface? I know you and I were chatting about a, a fellow in, the, in British Columbia named, I wrote it down, named Osprey, who Is seems it to be focusing on nutrition and uh, what we should or shouldn't be, uh, be consuming. He is, David Asprey is apparently the, the father of the term biohacking. So very interesting about, um, and this kind of leads into the conversations you were having before, Perry, with your, with your groups here and about information. And, and what's, what I'm curious about is at this point in time, we have access to more information than we've ever had. And we do have the wherewithal to extend our lives to 120. So that's all part of the, the AI and the, the new accessibility of the information yet this, and this is what's really interesting uh, about this food conversation for me. We have this information yet is, our, our choices are not, um, uh, <laughs> they're not congruent with this information. And I'm wondering whether it's an overwhelm of the choice, as you said, going down the, the aisles and the potato, how do we make the potato sexy like, like cauliflower? We were talking about cauliflower and if you were to choose a vegetable, I mean, cauliflower is the one that's come up in the world. Finally, it's, a, it's not relegated to that uh, sad, sorry, bland side dish. Now it's, uh, it's like the agent called <laughs> and pizza's interested. <laughs> And, and rice. So, so how do you get this, this idea about the potato and, and, and dissolve that? But um, Tom and, and Vicky were talking about uh, cereal as well. And this whole, I, I can't help but feel that the history of food is just as important and that this entire time we've been sold this bill of goods. And it, do, you, do you all know the, the, the history of the Kellogg's and, and the cereal and, <laughs> and the no fat movement and how it was developed by Dr. Kellogg because of his religious affiliation and he wanted to lower fats to Im, impact um, uh, testosterone levels because he wanted to reduce passion and, and, and masturbation. So the idea of an entire food movement based on an, a religious uh, mm -hmm. and how we we're still I mean we're we're 2023 and and this is uh this is still not impacting our our fully formed adult 
choices in what so, we so when we if, if knowledge is relevant if, if, with all of the choices we have you would think that the primary objective would be to help people become informed enough or educated enough to make informed choices about what they eat and yet we're hearing it's the right hemisphere it's convenience it's time it, it, nutrition is one of the last things uh, if, if at all on the list uh, Michelle, do you want to add anything here? I saw you nodding your head at one point regarding Kellogg. Now, uh, as I said to uh, uh, to others, 10 minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, Haley uh, nailed it with um, with the um, the whole the um, sorry, I have to go back with the religion thing because it's the second day Adventist that brought it all in and Kellogg's was a part of it and it was the whole history back in the 1920s. And there have been some doctors as well that have come forward with a lot of this information. And it's like, it goes on deaf ears. People just don't care what's in their food anymore. They don't care about the history behind the food. They just want to eat and not be bothered with, with what they're eating. They, and to be honest, it's very difficult to eat in a completely clean, um, food system that is dominated by processed food. I eat very clean and no processed food. I have a hard time going to one store, finding everything that I need. It's impossible. It's actually, for the most part, I find impossible to eat 100% unprocessed. So mm -hmm. people have to do the best they can. And what's in the store is all processed. So people, people for the most part, there's some kind of processing involved in most foods these days. It's it's near impossible to not have anything that's completely clean. And that's the problem is what food is available. Well, I, I don't think we're advocating for purists, but we are advocating for moderation. That's come up numerous times. Vicki, did you want to add something there? Well, I, I don't find it difficult to eat unprocessed food. I buy meats, I buy vegetables. I buy potatoes, I buy fruit, um, I do buy bread. So in that sense, it's processed because I haven't baked it myself. But, you know, my freezer is full of all sorts of convenience food that I made and put there. I make soup and put it in jars. I make spaghetti sauce and put it in jars. I make stew and put it in containers. Mm -hmm. And when I come home and want something frozen and easy to heat up, I just shop in my freezer. And I you don't buy packaged cereals. I don't ever. buy frozen dinners. Um, I, I don't really like salads, so I don't need to worry about salad dressings. But, okay, so uh, Vicki, um, Michelle made a comment that you're not normal. That's not your typical. Wait, 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 just a minute. She, she, she may not be normal. She may not be typical. But <laughs> how is it? That you have become an informed consumer. What, what, what in your history was it? Your parents? Was it your teacher? Was it the fact you were raised on a farm? Why, why would you say today that you are a more mindful consumer? Well, none of none of those because my parents bought all the packaged and processed foods. Okay. Um, but I had borderline cholesterol, and my doctor wanted to give me statins, okay. and I did not want them. I said I wanted to address it through diet and exercise. And I don't exercise nearly enough and I have deteriorating discs in my spine. So exercising is very difficult, but I made a point and particularly during the pandemic when I didn't go out to restaurants because there weren't any that were open uh, of, of cooking my own food. And I, you know, about a year ago, I went to my doctor, I did the blood work and I went in to renew some prescriptions. And she said, um, so your cholesterol is way down. What are you doing? You know, like, are you buying statins on the internet or something? <laughs> and I said, no, I mean, it's taken time. It was coming down gradually. It blipped up, it went down, and then it really went down quite a bit. It can be done. And um, I don't really, in, no, I, I do eat out at restaurants, so I'm not eating totally unprocessed food there. <laughs> And I always have French fries because I don't want to eat uncooked food that somebody else has produced. I don't want a salad. I don't know who's touched it. I don't know what's in it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, you know, E. coli is in the lettuce. So I, I want to eat food that's been cooked recently when, when I go out. Um, I'd be happy to have a baked potato, but I don't eat sour cream and all the other stuff they want to put on it. 
So it wasn't, it, it was health. It wasn't body appearance. It wasn't looks. It was you realized because you'd, you'd bumped into a health issue that it was time to take a look at diet and the relevance of diet to your lifestyle. And that cha you changed your behavior. Changing human behavior is not an easy, easy. Market owners will tell you that. In World War II, when North America was running short on um, meats, really, because they were being shipped over to the troops in World War II, they wanted to get people to eat kidneys and liver and whatever. And they had to come up with phenomenal marketing campaigns. They learned a lot in social psychology about consumption. Um, and it's not the brain that necessarily makes the decision on what it's going to eat. It's a lot of, as Trevor and, and Greg and Brianna have echoed, uh, a lot to do with, with appearance, uh, appetite, uh, convenience. Uh, Barry, uh, you made an observation to me at one point in time, which will set up our, our webinar possibly for next week. Uh, and that is the fact that Alberta is notoriously... Uh, in the French fry business, there's something that was done in Alberta to enable this to take place. What What is it among economists or, or among businesses that enabled us to establish such a strong position in an international market? And is that model replicable? Well, I hope it's replicable. Um, and uh, I think it's extendable. Um, in, in fact, it was driven out of having the opportunity, watching the opportunities out of the Pacific Northwest U.S. And uh, the, uh, then a partnership that is required in any of our raw material that we produce and export it at ridiculously uh, low price because we're producing high quality and higher quality raw materials than others. And it doesn't, it, it does not uh, just be the food industry that's doing this. It's uh, minerals, it's uh, oil and gas, it's, uh, you can go on and on and on. And um, the, uh, the opportunity really was delivered because there was a willing partnership between the producers, the irrigation districts, um, the uh, uh, attraction of people who uh, had the skills required in, uh, to internationally export. The timing was right because uh, markets like Japan and China and uh, for much of my career, um, the China imported French fries, most of them came out of Southern Alberta. Mm. Um, it, was, it was smart business. Uh, it was doing things in a, a responsible way. It was the fact that we had considered internationally one of the safest, if not the safest food system in the world. Um, it was a, a bunch of things that came together. The one that in this, um, in this case, uh, the, listening to the discussion, uh, that hits me the most is um, I graduated from the University of Toronto with a, uh, a degree with a major in food chemistry in 1961. And the scientist that taught me uh, at that time, uh, when we graduated, told us that the uh, best advice they could give because of the individuality of every consumer, we're all different. Uh, and Brianna, you mentioned that. Um, it is uh, that you had, uh, the individual had uh, to moderate consumption of everything and that would give you with approved foodstuffs would give you a balanced diet. I uh, had five years at the University of Minnesota in uh, uh, working with the, the leading, uh, the leaders in uh, food processing technology. Um, and basically that was the same message 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that uh, was still coming out. It's still the right message. Um, and um, 
I think the pharmaceutical industry is the best example of, of why all of that takes place. And that is pharmaceuticals produced for DNA that is Asian based are far less intensive than the pharmaceuticals that are needed in North America for, for uh, non-Asian DNA, uh, whether they, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, in other words, if you get sickened in China, uh, you're going to have to take twice as much as the, uh, uh, the Chinese citizen that has the same kind of disease. And they're well aware of that in the ph pharmaceutical industry. I don't think the food industry is any different, except that we don't recognize it the same way. And then within those barriers, if you will, you have every one of us is different than, than the other. Uh, the thing that boggles my mind is gluten. And it's a bad thing. If it wasn't for gluten, the human race wouldn't be on this planet. Uh, and that goes uh, uh, way beyond uh, uh, maybe even humans being in, uh, in North America or in uh, the Americas. Um, and lots of, uh, lots of scientific reasons why if you don't start with gluten in your diet when you're very young, you can uh, become intolerant. Uh, we, we've, but, we've shifted from the economics of the French fry uh, to gluten, uh, and that could be a, a topic in itself. Um, but uh, is there anything further you wanted to add, uh, Trevor, regarding wh why it is that Alberta uh, became the center for the production of French fries in, uh, in the world? Again, I think it comes down first and foremost to climate and the, the capacity of our environment here. But it's 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 also a talented workforce. It's things like location, our ability to access sports, trade agreements. I mean, it's a it's a complex ecosystem of reasons. Uh, but fundamentally, we're able to grow a very high quality crop at a very cost effective cost compared to any other jurisdiction, I would argue, in North America. And that that's the fundamental reason for the success. But some businessmen must have spotted that because what you've said is knowledge and knowledge in itself goes nowhere unless a human being decides to capitalize on it. So were there leaders? Was there, did the government get involved and say, gentlemen, we've got an opportunity that's being missed here. You've got to work on, how did that knowledge get crystallized into actually building an industry? Right. It, it's, it's not unlike the canola industry, right? That was essentially invented in Western Canada based on marketing the opportunity, putting the regulatory framework in place. We're seeing emerging things for now in plant proteins and even Haskap berries as an example, right? That's a very popular item in Japan that's exported from Alberta and Saskatchewan that frankly, I don't think existed even 10 years ago, but someone spotted the opportunity. They planted it, they started working with the crops. They've now got processing facilities and hopefully that becomes the next potato. So there, there must be partnerships that are emerging, the networks established, people, Connecting and together deciding we have a common vision that we need to do something consistent and together in order to realize this. And capital then followed. Uh, Barry, uh, you're muted. Yeah, um, I throw a name out because I've been around at this longer than anybody else on the call. And that's Clive Schreppmeyer. And he was employed by he was the potato specialist for the uh, Department of Agriculture. And uh, I don't know whether Clive's even still alive today, but he was the one that saw the vision that uh, coalesced a whole bunch of people that came together. And he convinced me as an example that this was a huge opportunity that was worth pursuing. Thank you. I, I think that's a point really worth reinforcing. Uh, it is often a, the catalyst being an individual with a vision being relentless and passionate. We saw that in the uh, oil sands uh, that became a multi-billion dollar industry uh, on, on which Alberta uh, rests and North America benefits and Canada in particular. We're seeing with the potato industry, an individual who had a passion and re relentless in building the network and advancing that cause. Uh, Greg, did you have your hand up there? Anything you want to add? Okay, go ahead, Tom. Unmute. 
Tom, unmute. I look for pauses when I do the editing. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's it's just this thing about, um, you know, you're going on about French fries and whatnot. Really, I've read lots on the stuff we put on the French fries, the ketchup, so much sugar and ketchup. And what is more dangerous, the French fry or the ketchup? Now in Europe, of course, the Brits, they don't eat as much ketchup as we do. They have malt vinegar, which I'm sure is not as harmful as ketchup. I'm just curious what what the reaction is to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Greg, because you're the chef. You, you, you know what you put on the table as what they call condiments. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I can't I can't comment on the health uh, implications there, but I definitely second that point, Don or Tom. Sorry. Um, yeah, the French fry is just one part of the equation. Typically, you're not just having French fries in a vacuum. You're going to season them. Some seasonings, you know, to nowadays it's not just salt; it's salt and sugar, um, and it's not just French fries. It's French fries that have been blanched and then coated in some kind of potato starch as well. So yeah, great point. We're, we're not just talking about French fries. Also, you know, milkshakes or pop or, you know, soda pop to go along with these fries are also, you know, big factors here, health speaking. No, I'll, I'll confess that uh, in the last few months, I, whether I attribute to Michelle or to those around me, I've decided it's time to become more cognizant of what I eat. And someone said popcorns. Pretty innocent. So I only put a lot of sugar and a lot of butter on the, my popcorn, but uh, other than that, <laughs> I haven't been able to lose a pound. I don't quite understand it, but uh, go from there. Right. Trevor, uh, we're getting near the end. You, you want to add anything further, to whether it relates to consumption or to the building of this industry? Uh, you've got a huge plant being uh, proposed uh, by McCain's in Lethbridge. That must have taken the effort of someone with a vision to bring a, a, such a, a, a massive supplier into, into Lethbridge. Can you give us any color around that? Yeah, I mean, the, most of the major producers are in this region. So McCain has an existing plant in Lethbridge County. Mm -hmm. And the announcement that they made recently was to double that plant in size. So it's a $600 million investment. And it's their largest capital investment in the company's history. But they're they're just one player. So we have another uh, Cavendish Foods has a French fry processing plant here. It was a $420 million investment a number of years ago. Lamb Weston, which is ConAgra, has a facility. So I suspect the McCain announcement is just the first of several as these other competitors in that space react and continue to, you know, to, to continue to feed a hungry, growing whole, hungry world out there. Uh, but it's, you know, potatoes, let's, you know, again, Frito-Lay has a potato chip plant in this region. There's a Star Produce has a dehydration plant. So we get potato dehydrated potatoes. There's table fresh operations. French fry is certainly the dominant export from this region, but the, the uh, humble potato is responsible for a great deal of many more products and things that come out of this region as well. Well, you're doing something right. Uh, as many of you know, we've been hosting a economic uh, resilience survey for many years now. Uh, and it was about five years ago that it became apparent that one of the regions in the province was becoming much more buoyant um, about its economy and its diversification. And that was Southern Alberta. It stood out uh, obviously different than the other regions that we were assessing. And I suspect it had something to do with the emergence of agriculture and uh, the continued diversification beyond uh, energy and, and mining uh, and forestry, which was more in the north. But uh, uh, a credit to the leaders in southern Alberta that saw the opportunities in agriculture that led to a more diversified economy. And, it, and it's showing up in sentiment surveys. We don't ask them about, about numbers and dollars. We simply ask them, what are their hearts telling you? And they're telling you that the economy in southern Alberta is robust and, uh, and emerging. So good, good on you. Uh, uh, Brianna, do you want to add anything to the conversation as it relates to con consumption and or the economy? I was just going to say in NISCU, and me personally aspire to be Trevor and the South, we have Little Potato Company, which came to North NISCU, which was a big deal for us. Um, I actually have a group of about five food processors. So to me, that's the beginning of a cluster that we should take notice 
but it can have it can't it can be in other places other than just Lethbridge. There's lots of spots for it in the province. And I also find it interesting in my day job in economic development, this is what we want. We want food processors, we want value added, we want large base companies. But in the evening at our local flower farm where we sit down and have dinner with the chef cooking in the field, we also talk about all the other things that big egg doesn't necessarily talk about or share with. Um, so it's a really interesting juxtaposition to be in the space that I'm in in the daytime and the nighttime. Yeah, it, it is fascinating to see the the channel, the food channel from the, the small producer, uh, the farming. I mean, people in Alberta uh, care about growing. They care about growing things, maybe because we've got a short growing season. But whatever it is from the individual citizen up to the large corporation, uh, agriculture is a major part of our economy, a major part of what is on our plate, uh, a major part of our lives. Uh, Go ahead, Tom, and then I'll go back to Haley. Yeah, it's, there's just, and I, I'm sure Trevor's aware of this, is a company out to just north of uh, Lacombe uh, called Enermerch, and they're tapping into wells and taking the natural gas from orphan wells or dead wells, no longer used wells, pumping it into generators, and then from the generator, taking off the heat, taking off the electrical energy, of course, and CO2. Then they're pumping the CO2 back into these Greek, huge greenhouses. They have about 37 acres of greenhouses, and they're producing wonderful peppers and uh, uh, zucchini, um, cucumbers, and so on and so on, just on our doorstep. So that you want, to mention, you want to mention the name of the company? Yeah, it's called Intermerge. Okay, thank and you. They, they, they uh -huh. bought in with. They're they're also tied in with now with a big company out of um, uh, Medicine Hat. And they they produce similar stuff, but they've now combined their efforts uh, to produce different things. Like these people in the north of um, uh, Lacombe, they produce wonderful peppers, whereas the people down in, in near Medicine Hat, they produce other products that are uh, more suitable for the climate. So th these things are all happening out there. And it's really, well, and really we interesting. And I mean, we've I've seen geothermal being used in automated uh, greenhouses where no human being really is in that greenhouse at all. It's all done robotics and uh, automated. Haley, you want to add anything here? Uh, just a, a quick note. My my cousin, um, who's a senator, just posted something on her timeline uh, recently about how um, they went to the University of Guelph and they're doing a research project on on soil and um, farm plots and what's growing. So they dug up as part of their research, um, school children were invited to bury 100% cotton underwear in the soil to see what broke down um, more efficiently. So she called it the airing of dirty political laundry. But uh, I'm thinking because she's the Alberta Senator, this would be a, a really wonderful opportunity for her to come and speak to this um, economic uh, component of the province. I think this is really amazing. Well, you can reach out to her. We're all ears and always looking for someone interesting to uh, to present. So uh, I'm, I'm going right? uh, to go around the room and uh, ask the, the audience if there's any other questions. Otherwise, I'll ask uh, each of the presenters to do a bit of a wrap up on what they've heard today and what they would uh, like us to remember. So Laura, any any uh, comments you want to make? Or Shirley or Michelle? Or I Sid had a question. I was wondering what the state of our organic growing is. Is that on a huge increase? And how about the use of pesticides and fertilizers these days? Okay, the, the state of our what? The, the state of the organic growing, oh, if, it's, okay. if it's increasing, and okay. the use of pesticides and herbicides. Sure, and, and this has been a very big point. I can recall 20 years ago going down to Red Deer and talking about the opportunities in, in organic gardening. Uh, uh, Brianna, you want to add anything there about your, your awareness? I, I know I saw you grimace there, and you are humble, I know that, but is there anything you want to add? Uh, or make comment on regarding organic gardening or organic uh, marketing? I, I, I don't have science in front of me. I can only tell you what our small farm does. Mm -hmm. um, we, and to be honest, 
Um, it's again, trying to remove um, commercial inputs from mm -hmm. our farm in order to be able to tell our customers with certainty where everything comes from. That our kid, our dog, whoever can play within the flowers, you can pick them, you can smell them without traces of herbicide, pesticide, fungicide for when flower, and for me, flowers is very different because there are no regulations um, with the use the same way that there is with food. Um, and so again, I think part of it is a preference thing and an ability to pay um, that can drive that. But on a commercial level, I don't know where it is at in comparison to where it's been. Well, I mean, we certainly know that there has been a lot of controversy around the usage of herbicides uh, and health. Um, uh, and even we're, we're seeing the controversy around genetic engineering in agriculture. But the, the discussion today is not so much getting into the te technology of agriculture, which is massive and changing dramatically the, the, the production, uh, both in terms of the for sources of energy as well as the relevance of technology for monitoring the fields. And I mean, agriculture is going through a huge revolution. Uh, we saw that five years ago in a conference in Red Deer on uh, um, convergence and, uh, and innovation. And agriculture stood number one as the industry that was most opportunistic in terms of new innovations in technology, whether it be uh, data processing, uh, robotics, and, and, and drones. Uh, water usage uh, and genetic engineering, all of them were having a bearing on increasing productivity, reducing uh, harmful uh, products. Uh, Trevor, do you want to elaborate on any any point that I just made there or reinforce it or criticize it? Yeah, you know, to, to Shirley's question, I'm not entirely sure about the acres. We, there's a lot of growers, there's a lot of companies looking at organic practices in quotation marks, I'm not sure they would be certified as organic necessarily, but certainly growers are always looking for better, safer alternatives. And there are companies, uh, Greenleaf is a lettuce warehouse just outside of Lethbridge. They have a fairly significant facility. It's mostly automated in terms of harvesting the lettuce, almost untouched by human hand. And I know they use particularly procured bugs rather than chemicals uh, to manage you know, pests inside of the greenhouse operation. But Again, producing on a commercial scale and at a reasonably affordable price point is challenging from an organic perspective. And so I think that's one of the key limitations in terms of balancing feeding, you know, providing what for demand, uh, but doing that in a cost effective way. So, yeah, good question. I don't know from an about it perspective, the number of acres that would be considered organic versus not and what that trend has looked like. But I suspect it's not huge growth just based on the complexity. Someone made the observation recently, and it, it does uh, it does elaborate on a point that you've made when you talk about price points uh, and affordability. Uh, there, there is a point where the government attempts to step in because profit being so alluring, uh, it would always be tempting. It seems to me, it seems to be logical to the general public that profit being as uh, tempting as it is, that you would skirt the edges and allow something unhealthy into the market if it meant more profit. Now, you, you have come from the food processing industry and many of the in the webinar today have been in business. It is tempting to make money, but it is also tempting to violate issues of health and safety in order to make that profit. You've indicated time and again, Trevor, that uh, we have attempted to do certain things with the clitamides that would be making them more healthy, implying that businesses are conscious of the of the health of the citizens. Uh, you want to reinforce that point or or check it? Yeah, I mean, food is let's 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 be clear. Food is a very regulated space, uh, particularly if you're crossing provincial international borders. And even when the government doesn't regulate something, most large multinationals subscribe to various international certifications that place themselves under an even higher standard. And you know, again, I can only speak to myself. I, I worked in an environment where I was the guy signing a, a hold tag and it was my decision whether we were releasing that product to the market or not. And so if there was a risk of cross-contamination or perhaps an undeclared allergen, I, I knew it was my autograph between me and a four-year-old having an allergic reaction and going into, going into the hospital. So I can tell you, I personally took that very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was never a conversation where it was well, how much money is this going to cost us as opposed to, am I going to prison? 
that was always first and foremost on the top of my brain, frankly, is like, I don't care how much it costs, what's the risk to me personally and to the, and to the operation? Because all it takes is one recall, even for a large, big branded multinational company, and you're in a world of hurt. So it's, yes, profit's alluring, but it's not the only trade-off. And most good business people, I think, are keenly aware of the trade-offs. There's always bad actors, but uh, it, you know, if, you're, if you're in the business of food, your product is going into people's stomachs. You're very conscious of that and what it means. I, I'm glad you've been able to reinforce that point. And I think you also indicated that most, uh, we, we have a heavily regulated industry in, in food. We have a very high level of trust. People walk into a supermarket and they trust what's on the shelves is safe for them. But the points have been made that there's ongoing research all the time in order to take a look at what, what might or might not be healthy and might or might not be nutritious. Uh, Shirley, you've uh, made a comment. Sh Michelle, you want to add anything here? Going once. Sydney, any points you want to make? Laura. Tom. I'm, I'm going to get to Tom in a second. Barry, you want to make any concluding observations or comments? Okay. Haley? Okay, Ron? All right. Uh, your turn, Tom. Any any concluding <laughs> points? Or no, just just while we've got Greg here, my son was a top chef in Vancouver, and finally he had to sort of step away from it for a number of reasons. But, you know, he told me working in a restaurant, and I just was curious what Greg's uh, reaction would be to this question. Um, he, uh, in, in the preparing of food in a restaurant, you're looking at about 15 to 20 minutes, that food being on your in front of the, the customer. And uh, that is very difficult to do with some meals, right? And so my son was telling me that really it's all tricks. They have all these different tricks that they do. And, and he would like do a big vat of risotto in the morning, make little cakes of risotto. And then he would throw that into the deep fryer for just a few seconds. Then that would end up on your plate. And you would think that's a really lovely, fresh bit of risotto. So I'm just curious about Greg's experience in all of Short that. Cuts, Shortcuts. Jeff, any, or Greg, any comment you want to make there? Yeah. One's person, one person's shortcut is another person's uh, <laughs> ready to go prep, right? Um, no, I honestly, the, the practice you described, I would say is pretty well industry wide. I mean, people have certain expectations. They want to sit down, and within five minutes of ordering something, they're expecting to have something delicious delivered. And so rising expectations and, um, you know, more knowledge of what's out there is driving more creative prep or more creative systems. And that was part of cooking that I actually really loved is how are we going to execute based on, you know, the following parameters, you know, we have a a closet for a kitchen in a, in an art gallery and people are have paid $500 a, a ticket and they expect some kind of, you know, inspiring food. So there's always some, you know, intersection of uh, what's, what's feasible, functional and tastes good. You know, I just want to say I've loved, I've loved the discussion. I love a lot of the points by, by everyone, particularly Trevor and Brianna. I really appreciate you guys commentary. This has been great. Good. Well, I see, Jeff, you've got your hand up. Uh, I'm going to skip uh, skip around and then we'll wrap it up. Jeff, uh, you have any concluding observations or comments? Question? Uh, just that I, um, it, the technologies that are coming in the near future are, are, are incredible. And one of the things that I was reading about recently was um, how dairy is going to change, for instance, with uh, instead of having to grow cows, we'll probably be making the ingredients for milk in uh, using bacteria to produce specific hormone or not hormones, but proteins. And um, basically milk is mostly water, of course, and you got about 3% solids. So a lot of that can be done inside of uh, vats and just assembled. And at the end of the day, uh, it can probably be done in, in a way that uh, will be almost indistinguishable from the natural process without the need for all the methane and the cattle and the, you know, the cruelty and, and uh, stuff that might be associated with the dairy industry. Um, and and uh, in my book, I've got two chapters that talk about uh, aquaculture 
and um, you know changes that are going to happen in in terms of growing stuff and greenhouses and and um, uh, I foresee a future where we'll be able to have natural processes like basically be able to grow uh, fish using you know the algae and copepods and and all of the things that are in nature and produce and control all of those things to improve on the quality of what's there without hurting the natural systems but at the same time uh be better than what's being done in the farm fish industry right now where we're you know uh, putting in omega-3s and stuff at the end of the the process but the um uh you know, along the way, they're being fed grains and, and other stuff that might have PCBs in them or, or whatever. Uh, so it's not as healthy a process product right now as the as the natural fish are. But in the future, I think we'll be able to do it better than what's in nature, particularly in the Arctic Ocean. And that's part of what I write about in my book. So the one thing we haven't talked about today, uh, and it's a little bit late to introduce the topic is garbage. Uh, I mean, what's on your plate? 40, I don't know what the percentage is. I think it's around 30%, but 30% of what's on the plate ends up in the garbage. So there, there's clearly a lot of waste that goes into it. We, people are obviously um, consuming a lot, but they're also wasting a lot. Uh, I don't know whether Greg, uh, Trevor, or Brianna have any observations or comments to make about um, what's on your plate and what shouldn't be on your plate because there's too much on it ends up in the garbage or you're, you're too busy to finish a meal. Uh, Greg, you must have seen that in the restaurant business of, and I certainly saw it when I was a waiter of how much food actually came back into the kitchen afterwards. And it wasn't that it was poorly prepared. Um, people want a large serving, but maybe they throw much of it away or, or they put it in the refrigerator. They don't know how to store an avocado. They leave it outside and it gets aged, leave it in the refrigerator. It can last weeks. I will say there's a there's a direct correlation between the uh, let's say the refinement or the prestige of a restaurant and the overall wastage. Let's say historically speaking, there are some forward thinking restaurants that are now claiming to be no waste. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, the higher end the restaurant, the more waste there is mm -hmm. um, because there's higher and higher expectations uh, associated with those. Yeah. Well, it's an issue. I mean, we, we know we've got problems in terms of, uh, of landfills and the amount of land that gets devoted to landfills. And much of, the, of what's in there is what one would call food garbage or food waste. Um, that's an issue in itself, something we haven't touched on at any length today, but it certainly goes into what's on your plate and what's in the garbage. Uh, who else haven't I called on? Claire, any observations or comments you want to make? No? And so we are left with wrap-up time. Uh, Ron, uh, Ron Main, uh, all I have is your, your room. I don't see that you're present, so I'm, I'm going to leave you, let, let, let you off the hook. Uh, okay, I'll go around the room. Uh, Brianna, any concluding comments on consumer choice, what we should be doing? Maybe teachers and parents should be listening. Well, I think it's interesting because we're in a time of more information than we've ever had, but we get into decision paralysis and just resort back to um, the habits and the food patterns and what's easy and convenient for us. I also think what's really interesting about this conversation is um, we in Alberta have the ability to grow high quality, safe food, which is super exciting for the agriculture and food industry, whether you're a small local person or um, companies looking to get big. Um, with regard to educating children and families, I don't know. I grew up in a family where my mother was a home economist and did everything from scratch. And I can remember as a kid being so mad that I had all these home baked goods and everybody else had fruit by the foot. Huh. And and now I just wish I had half the ability to um, create all the home-based things that my mother used to. Thank you, Brianna. Uh, Greg, anything, any concluding comments or observations you want to make about today? Um, I think just, you know, consider all, all these factors, you know, when you're at the grocery, well, if you start making decisions when you're at the grocery store, you, you're definitely one step behind. Uh, you know, um, it does take a lot of continual work, but it doesn't have to happen all at once. You know, if you're getting 1% better every month, you'll be there. 
be interesting if there is a technology emerging that would really help people in making wise choices. We've seen technology enter into so much of human uh, our, our lives or to save time, to be efficient. It'd be interesting to see a technology emerge that would be at the store or, or that you carry in your, your wallet or your purse that could help you uh, align your decision making with all of the choices that you're confronted with. Uh, Vicki, and then I'm going to go to Trevor for wrap up. I'm just thinking of those companies that send you a packaged meal with all of the ingredients, the instructions, and in theory, no waste. And the advertisement shows, you know, two small plates for the kids, two larger plates for the adults, and a very unhappy raccoon who's not getting any scraps. Right. Um, but, you know, that is convenient, but it's not really, and I guess it's home cooking, but it's not really your own cooking. I worry about meat that turns up on my doorstep. I, I was wondering whether those companies that are today providing uh, meals to your home, uh, what the value is and how we might judge the nutritional value, the health relevance, I suspect is very high. I mean, they, if, they, if they ever failed, they'd be out of business in a minute. I mean, a supermarket can make a mistake, but I can't imagine someone delivering food to the house surviving uh, a Tucker Carlson. Uh, Trevor? You want to give us the final words? Uh, you know, I think, again, food is, is so complex and so interesting and so fascinating. But at the end of the day, people that have made change in their life take ownership, right? So it's about finding the time to make and prepare your own goods. So that if you're like Vicky, uh, shop from your freezer. I think that's a great line. It, but that takes effort. It takes education. It takes prep. But if that's important to you, then you need to own that process, right? If you don't know what you're putting in your body, then you need to learn how to read labels. You need to talk to a nutritionist. You need to get that information. But we as consumers need to own that process and take ownership for it. But at the same time, I think we there's there's reasons to be optimistic. And I'll, I'll sort of come back to where you ended, Perry, with the whole garbage piece, right? There, there are biodigester technologies. Lethbridge Biogas is one that comes to mind. Food waste can be an, an important feedstock and generate renewable power. Uh, extender producer responsibility or EPR regulations are coming into Alberta here very soon, where companies that produce a product that creates waste now have to take ownership of handling that waste, which is a bit of a landmark change in Alberta's sort of commercial system in terms of how recycling functions. So there are solutions, whether they be regulatory or just, you know, public pressure. And that's part of that education piece. We can, we can make big companies make big changes, but it's about having the information and being able to sort of influence those decisions in my mind. Well, this topic is almost a, a curriculum in itself and whether or not it, it's our young kids uh, growing up in school or whether it's in their homes or where, where we can ensure that the future generations are wiser than maybe the former generations because they're gonna have even more choices uh, and more, more therefore conflict than we've been exposed to. So I'm delighted with the with the input we got from you today, Greg and, and Trevor and Brianna. Thank you very much. I, Vicki, I'm delighted you joined us today and, and Tom with your questions, uh, Shirley that you spoke up and, and Jeff with your viewpoint and Haley. And of course, Michelle, uh, who I have to give so much credit to of having an, inspired this topic. Uh, and have written so much to help me get educated and prepared for it. So I thank you all. Um, I wish you a, a good warm weekend and a, a great spring because it has arrived. So get out there and start planting and eat well. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Claire. Thank you, everybody. If anybody wants to hang around for an after party, you're welcome to do so. We don't record these, but sometimes the, some of the most interesting discussion of all occurs during the after party. Mike.